Hello, everyone. Welcome to our presentation today. Um, the presentation will be on the title, as you see here, Hype versus Reality, the COVID-19 Impact on Supply Chain. And we have two guest speakers, um, Professor uh, Jörg Hofstetter from the Catch Business School and Dr. Patrick Schroeder from um, the Chatham House. And they will introduce themselves as well as the topic. We also have a paper that goes along with this presentation that was published in IEEE Engineering Management Review, volume 49, number two, the second quarter of June, 2021. And the title of that paper is From Panic to Dispassionate Rationality, Organizational Responses and Procurement After the Initial COVID-19 Pandemic Peak. Um, you can contact me if you want a copy of that paper, if you don't have a copy of the paper already. Um, the way we will do this is uh, Professor Hofstetter and Dr. Schroeder will make their presentation, and then we'll have a discussion afterwards on some points and issues that may have arose during the presentation. So right now, I hand it over to Professor Jörg Hofstetter. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joe, for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to present and discuss with you the results of a survey that we made uh, in the last year. Uh, my background is uh, I'm a uh, mechanical engineer and worked also in industry uh, in the field of engineering, but also management in some different parts of the world. Joined academia and ever since got uh, very interested in how things are made, why they are made, what's behind that. So that brings me to the question of uh, the sharing of work and naturally to procurement. And as you all remember uh, in the COVID, uh, when COVID started, procurement was on everyone's agenda because we were lacking some materials, uh, stuff was going differently. And uh, up until today, there's a lot of supply chain issues that we're facing caused by the COVID um, pandemic directly or indirectly. So about a year ago, we sat together and said, well, we want to know from procurement and supply chain professionals about how that um, new reality is changing the way how they operate, the change how they're approaching business, and um, what are just changes during that time, and what are changes that will persist. So what we saw is the biggest challenges in the crisis came from the lockdowns. In the obligation to distance, to not knowing how that virus shares, people were taken um, apart from another. And um, it also was a responsibility that employers had for the health of their employees. So that was naturally one of the um, most direct impacts that, that we found, which is understandable and also a very good thing that it was approached in that way. The dependencies and the business partners appeared as underestimated threat. So that means that companies looked at dependencies like in every uh, crisis situation, finding out and what I cannot act as I want, I'm restricted. That's the whole idea of dependence. So I'm limited in the way that I can respond. And whenever there is an unexpected dependency, normally the solutions are unclear. People are looking different ways. You may remember there were people who say, well, we only do local sourcing because of the big issues is if you source from somewhere far, you can't go there. Anyways, during the lockdown, we couldn't go to a neighbor's house anyway. So the local sourcing was one of the approaches. The other part was that a lot of people took in and said, well, one of the big problems was we only have one supplier for that. And if that one supplier has an issue, well, we, we have an issue. So we're going to many now. And we all know that there's downsides to that because if you're buying from multiple, you're, you're reducing the amounts that you're procuring, you're becoming a less important customer, et cetera, et cetera. There was agility to it. There were lots of different ideas that were triggered about that. And 
it's not surprising that people respond to that because if you're limited on your degrees of freedom, this is something that you do. You just want to escape this, this iron cage that is around you. Interestingly, what we found is that supplier relationships were something that were mentioned very times by those who understood the concept of real relationships, of the value of relationships. So for those who had built up relationships over time, they had to build on something and that pandemic and the, the, the problems in the pandemic opened their appreciation, but also new nuances about what comes to and from a relationship. And that allowed them to value supplier relationships differently. In many times, increasing the value of relationships, of good relationships, and making much more clear about the low value of not so good relationships. A lot of people were talking about that cost saving focus in procurement. And as you remember, um, for decades, and in many organizations until today, if you want to make a career as a buyer, you're measured on one single performance factor. And that is, are you able to realize cost reductions? And we all know that there's very different ways to achieve that. There are some people who achieve that. Um, through um, joint work. So you're getting the inefficiencies out of the relationships and others by basically coming with coercive things and you're basically robbing a penny from the other. That cost saving focus is on one side determining the relationships, but on the other side, it's even putting in practice um, situations where we're taking buffer away, like it would be on stock levels. We are taking understanding away from markets. We're taking a lot of um, possibilities to respond away. So we're making the organization more fragile by the cost saving focus. And that's what a lot of organizations found out. But then the question is, if we're saying the cost savings are less the focus, what then is the new focus? And that was something where quite a few of the companies were struggling with and saying, well, what is then the new? If I look at it today, I still see when I work with companies that a lot of companies still measure their buyers by that single, single factor. And that is what were the cost reductions you realized? What we also were able to see was that many graved in stone routines were overruled by new practices. So in many of our global North organizations, what we're looking for is very good processes, highly efficient processes. And you may remember there is a book out there that is called If HP Would Know What HP Knows. The whole idea is if we have a great process in one part of our company, why aren't we using it in the rest of the company? And once these things are implemented, we're saying we don't change it because we know this is the best way of doing it. So whenever somebody says, well, let's, let's progress further, you're running against barriers because a lot of people say, well, we just homogenize that. We're just getting the best standard ruled out in the organization. Now you come with something new. Now in the pandemic, there was just no other way to, to allow things to be done differently. So all of a sudden, because of that, of that need, it was allowed to come up with new ideas. So all of a sudden we saw again, entrepreneurship. We saw again, cross-functional collaboration. And these things all of a sudden allowed to get beyond these, these routines, these these very strict processes. And if you just think about how we've graved a lot of our processes into IT stone in, um, in uh, ERP systems, et cetera, this is something that was overruled by that and changed what, what companies were doing. 
On one side on the process, we also observe that in the way how products are designed. If specific material was more difficult to get or specific material was much more expensive, then this was the moment to say, well, we always wanted to introduce a different material to that, but because of a lot of practices we have internally or high quality standard testing requirements and things we have, we didn't do that. If we wanted to do it, we probably would do that over a course of 20 years of testing and then introduce. And here we did it in two months because we had to. So that was these graved in stone routines that were overruled. Well, I guess we all experienced that home office that enforced need to distance, not to go into the office, not seeing colleagues, not seeing suppliers, changed a lot and opened up um, our desks and our minds to new ways of working on digital support into the ways that we're working. Limited travel, if any, there are still a lot of companies who still don't allow their employees to travel, needed different solutions, in particular when it comes to procurement. Imagine people who are procuring from far away countries like North America, Europe, procuring from China, procuring from Australia, procuring from the southern part of Africa, whatever. How do you maintain the relationships if you cannot travel? How do you know the other side? What's going on there? And then we saw quite interesting developments in particular on the multinationals um, who said, well, we probably don't need some of our buyers to travel. But what we do is we have local people who maintain the contact to these suppliers. So it's our own staff in that country who are the ones who are there to create a good relationship with this supplier and us. But for the nasty conversations about negotiations and conditions, price, et cetera, we still have our strategic buyers that are sitting in the corporate central procurement. But for these things, we don't need to travel. That's something we can do also online. So we can somehow separate different activities in the relationship between our company and our suppliers in saying some things can be done online, others can be done offline. And for the offline, then we create local staff who, who does that. We saw another, a more family company who said, who most of our suppliers are also family business like ours, and we maintain very good relationships on that. And actually what, the only reason that we need to travel is to maintain the good personal relationships among us. And there we don't really talk about the day-to-day -day business, the stuff where most people would be traveling. No, there we want to share our culture, our ideas, and we wanna know whether the others are still fitting in that respect to that. So we're traveling once or twice per year now, just to maintain the good relationship, but kind of the operative business, there's no need for travel. We do that on uh, ICT applications. There's many more, I'm just picking out a couple of interesting ones. And then there was something, and that is still out in the news. You still read a lot about the new normal or uh, building back, whatever what means, is there seems to be a change that is brought by that pandemic. So initially we went in and said, well, is that pandemic a spike change where a change is there? It, brings the change, but goes back to where it was before? Is that something that you just need to survive and then you continue with your old routines? Is that, if it is a spike, is that spike dropping back very quickly afterwards? Or is that something that runs down very slowly? We probably need different strategies to cope with how that spike goes down again. 
or is that something that stays? And well, what we know by now is the virus is still around. There's several mutations, so nothing that a lot of people are surprised about, others maybe are. So we are not in a post COVID time, we are in a with COVID time. So what is that new normal? And that change was of course also combined with other conversations that we've out there. Conversations that point to the circular economy like the European Commission was very quick to say, well, we have an idea, you may be aware that the European Commission's uh, economic development strategy decided, it's not a political question anymore, it's a question of execution, goes around what is called the Green Deal, which is based on a circular economy. Of course, it's not a circular economy right now, but it's moving on the transition towards a circular economy. So what are we doing with that? And that is something that companies were taking up and saying, well, if that is what politics and governments and administration are pushing what they're using uh, this crisis situation to, how do we adjust our own strategy, our own behaviors, our own setup um, to actually fit to what will come there in the future? Because one part is the new normal that is shaping by itself. And then there's this new normal that is shaped deliberately. Trying to change my slide. So as I said, our starting point was looking at progression and we looked at severity. So the progression was the spike going up and down or the lasting one. And the other one, and I haven't talked about that is how severe was that for different companies? And obviously you see different uh, companies being exposed differently to that. There were some that had very little impact while others, it was life-threatening. If you're running a restaurant and you cannot have any uh, customers in your restaurant, of course, that is life-threatening. For others, it had little impact. And for others, it even had a, uh, an opportunity. So how are these things coming together? Are those with a little impact and the spike able to maintain the normal operations? And are those where we say this is changing entirely how the world works and it's life-threatening, is that bringing that radical disruptive changes and that permanent changes that we're looking at? So what do we expect in a new normal? We expect a number of strong, broadly based forces that suggest for the near future, a pretty fundamental re-evaluation of the dependencies in supply chains. That's the first thing we can see. We see that in procurement and supply chain management, the idea of risk and risk assessments becomes much more hands-on by looking at individual relationships in individual buyer supplier relationships. So they are less about what is that kind of material or what is Africa or what is South America. It's much more looking at the dependencies that exist in the supply chains. We've looked at upstream supply chains, sub suppliers and suppliers to sub suppliers. But this was not something that companies have looked at, despite all these crises before um, have occurred and people have seen that if sub suppliers have a bottleneck, pose a bottleneck, that this is an implication if you're somewhere further downstream. But it was only during the crisis that this was something. It appears now that at least some companies are taking that more serious, that they are looking for ways to identify such dependencies also to more upstream parts in the supply chain. And not only to be aware of those, but to find a way to 
keep their hands on the developments in these dependencies. I talked about this revaluation of supplier relationships. And it seems that companies who experienced the benefits of good relationships, including large companies who'd been more uh, hard-nosed in their negotiations in the past, are appreciating the idea of mutual care. And also the idea of value creation together with the business partners. And mutual care could be very simple things like a supplier helping, um, like a, a buying company helping suppliers um, to stay, um, to stay in a business. So one example was that they, as customers, um, food suppliers, um, uh, food companies were able to justify to national governments that this supplier is needed to stay in business in order to supply them because otherwise there would not be enough food on the markets. So it was a mutual care in helping the suppliers to stay in operations, um, supplying them with advanced payments if there was a lack of cash and, and other things that are out there. We'll see a fast transformation to the digital working environments as I've already um, gone with some examples. Um, and it seems that despite we're seeing less and less of the lockdowns, that these tools are staying in use. And as someone said very nicely, one chief procurement officer said, well, we learned how to do our business with no travel. Why would we expect that anyone in management would allow these big travel budgets of the past? There's simply no need for it. So there is no other way to do the business than to do that. It remains to be seen where the company cultures are moving really towards more dynamic routines. Um, there's a bit of a slowdown now, now that we're going through longer times in the pandemic. Uh, at least at the beginning of the pandemic, that was something that was quite interesting to see. And we also need to keep it in that picture of um, the revisions of corporate strategy, supported also by a lot of regulation that helps, uh, that, that holds companies much more liable, not only responsible, but liable for what's going on in their supply chains. And that is something that comes together. So one of the CPOs we talked to from uh, a uh, Global 500 company said, well, at the beginning, we talked about how we would go through the crisis. And that was the moment where we realized this is gonna last for a bit of time. And we changed the way we looked at that. We were not looking at that as a threat but we're thinking about how can we look at this as an opportunity and how can we really bring the changes that we actually may need instead of where we're threatened by these changes, but we see these changes as an opportunity, even as a pure, an opportunity for our own services to be used. And I think that is the interesting part to that. Yet we still see a couple of issues and the thing that was mentioned the most is because of so much home office. One of the big unknowns is where company culture is today. Because as people were working from home, the typical culture development, being together, physically being together is lacking. And people were onboarded, other important leaders in the culture were leaving the company, leaving voids, others filling that. It will be quite interesting to observe in the next months to come when people are gathering more in offices about where the culture has developed. And many CPOs were actually uh, not sure they actually know where the culture is actually moving. So that will be a discovery. So that was an overview of, uh, of, my, uh, of the research that we did together. And I hand over to Patrick Schroeder to uh, bring in some more insights at, uh, in the work at Chatham House they were doing. Over to you, Patrick. 
Yes, great. Thanks, Jörg. Um, yes, yeah, so um, I'm a research fellow at Chatham House. Uh, Chatham House, in case you don't uh, know, uh, we have foreign policy research think tank, um, but we are not only interested in policy, but we're also interested in global economy and trade. Um, and my specific area is the circular economy, which also links to supply chains. Um, so I've prepared a few slides, uh, which is also part of the research that Jörg introduced, um, looking a little bit at uh, COVID and sustainability strategies of companies uh, and, and uh, the implications for the circular economy. So what we've done, um, so initially there were some indications that there are potential benefits of supply, sustainable supply chain management for mitigating the impact of the pandemic. So there were some publications on this when we started and the interviews that we then conducted um, to some degree confirmed this. Um, so the executives that we interviewed were um, emphasized that they were not keen to divert from their long-term sustainability strategies. Um, they, some companies, they even saw their sustainability efforts as an opportunity um, to do things differently and to reinvent products um, and to keep this long-term perspective. So this also um, then links to other more of, from the policy sphere, things that we've heard about building back better after the pandemic. And as Jörg also mentioned, um, some of the interviews referred also to the European Green Deal, which is uh, a long-term development strategy, industrial strategy, you could say that, for, for the European Union. And so, yeah, the companies were, were keen to emphasize that they uh, align with, with those larger term, long-term uh, directions. Um, do you want to go to the next slide, Jörg, please? Yeah, so we also um, try to understand a little bit um, the sustainability and supply relations. Um, so one of the CPOs we interviewed emphasized that they had invested already over the last decade um, a lot of uh, effort into building sustainable supply chains. And key element of that is to have reliable and trusted uh, supply relations. And so in the COVID pandemic, this, uh, this really paid off. Um, so they had these strong links, which were built on trust and was a good working relations. So they, their supply chains um, weren't as impacted as maybe others who hadn't previously done their homework in looking at the sustainability issues. Uh, next slide, Jörg. Thanks. So now, specifically regarding the circular economy, um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that. Uh, um, Professor Sarkis probably has given you a good um, introduction to that topic as well. Um, so we found that some of the circularity initiatives by companies uh, were impacted, um, especially in the short term. So as, as you might have heard also, there were uh, collection services uh, impacted, and as a result, there was limited access to some of the secondary resources, including scrap metals, um, aluminum, and cardboard. In the UK, we say aluminum. Um, that's the same thing. Um, so again, there were short-term compromises, but the companies which were involved or which are involved in the circular economy, again, emphasized that it hasn't impacted their long-term um, vision or long-term business model uh, around uh, circularity. Um, so yeah, next slide. So there, this is like um, an example from a company that we uh, talked to. Um, they were their leading metals recycling company with the uh, international supply chains. Um, so there was this uh, issue again about um, collection and recycling, but the other issue was also that um, aluminum smelters um, 
continue their primary production. So what we saw was a change in the price for primary and secondary materials, um, also uh, influenced by, by lower demand. Um, so, and that shifted uh, in a way the economics. Um, primary aluminum became more uh, competitive with the secondary materials, um, the recycled ones. So that's, that's again also more of a short-term um, uh, impact. Um, and you might have followed through the pandemic that there's been a whole range of changes again in the commodity prices, um, which is also interesting uh, maybe as a research topic to, to look into. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, this actually is not, not part of the, the research that we've done, but it's also, it was also published um, very recently. Uh, it's, it's from our policy analysis perspective, this is, this is quite interesting. Apparently there's a, sorry, there's a typo in there. It was published in June, 2021. So the White House 100 day review report, which very much looks about resilience of supply chains in some of the, in some key, key areas. So these, these four supply chains here, critical min minerals and materials, semiconductors, large capacity batteries, which are relevant for the, um, low carbon energy transition, and then pharmaceuticals, with that part is linked to the pandemic, um, of course. Um, so the, the reason I put it in here is, uh, it'd be interesting to, to see how um, this new policy direction from the White House will influence uh, supply chain resilience, and as well as uh, sustainable supply chains. And one of the things that I picked out from this is that the word recycling is mentioned almost 200 times. Um, so I would also expect to see this as a driver for more circularity in, in supply chains. Um, so I just stop here. Uh, if you have uh, questions, I'm happy to talk and discuss more details. Thank you, um, Patrick and Jorg. Um, I kind of primed up the um, our guests here. Uh, I would very be happy to entertain any questions for our speakers today. So um, Dallin, Alexa, or Nike, would you like to ask a question or get some clarification about some hot topic? Please don't be shy. Hey, I'm more just uh, speaking in just to kind of thank you for the presentation. Everything was actually pretty straightforward and clear. A lot of it was pretty cohesive with what we're kind of learning in class as well. Um, so no questions, but I do want to thank you guys for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Dallin. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for joining. Um, glad to hear you found it useful. Um, let, me, let me ask a question now. Um, one of the things that we keep hearing in the news is that this idea of JIT, just in time and lean supply chains, this was the major driver for, you know, becoming world class um, uh, companies and supply chains. And then all of a sudden, and I saw this in the Bloomberg article just the other day saying, oh, you know, they're going to have to rewrite the logistics and supply chains textbooks to say that this doesn't work, et cetera, et cetera. What is your opinion on that aspect of, because it's something that's very standard and accepted as uh, common sense knowledge that this is the way to run a supply chain, especially a global supply chain. Any comments on that? Well, we have uh, an answer from one CPO of a global 500 company on that. And that CPO was saying, of course, we're trying to keep our stock levels low. But on the other hand, we, pray, we probably overdid it on some parts. So the definition of what is the right level of a safety stock is very difficult to give if you're talking on numbers it's more reasonable to give when you talk about it. So in saying how much of this or that material should we keep on stock is difficult. 
NetCPO said, well, what we learned on that is that we have to have more active conversations about where we put our levels. So of course we're still optimizing and having our warehouses full of stuff is certainly not an answer. It is an answer of times when we know something happens. And quite a few of the CPOs said that they were not so surprised as the public was by the pandemic because a lot of, as they're multinational companies, they have colleagues who are in these countries. So they had firsthand reports about what's going to happen. And what they did was these companies who went actually quite well through the pandemic, they gathered this information, they built up stock levels on materials that they were getting signs might get problematic. And on other parts, they were just trying to get rid of stuff because they knew we can't use it. So it's not that just in time and uh, inventory management is not important, but it's just not that you get it run by a computer. You can get that done, but it still needs the brain of people of identifying what's coming up on the horizon. The yeah, maybe, go, ahead. go ahead, Patrick. I just, yeah, just add a couple of thoughts on this. Um, one from the circular economy perspective, one more from the Brexit UK perspective. So, as you know, the UK decided to leave the European Union and the um, common market, which means in practice now, uh, severe disruptions of, of supply chains. Um, so what the UK is experiencing is a um, policy-induced disruption of the just-in-time delivery. Um, so it's um, a lot more bureaucracy, a lot more paperwork needed for both exports and imports. And we see the effects uh, in the supermarkets, for example. Um, so there's uh, low availability of a uh, number of produce. And um, this is also coupled to um, not only goods being transported, but also affecting uh, people which are driving lorries. So um, it's also affected visa status. Um, and there's a, a shortage of um, truck drivers in the UK. Um, all of this is, is really impacting um, just-in-time delivery. Um, from the other from the other side, it's more links to generally inventories and Jörg just mentioning, mentioning getting rid of stuff. Um, Amazon has been here in the news recently about um, destruction of huge amounts of uh, unused products they have in the warehouses here um, on the scale of 100,000 items per week um, just because the cost of storing them is so high. Um, so that's not directly related to just-in-time delivery, but we seem to have a, a, a problem with the reverse logistics and the way uh, basically the, the supply chains are not set up to be circular. Um, so that all of this is something we need to think through if we, if we really want to become more resource efficient and, and design out waste from the way um, we produce and consume. And, and supply chain management plays a key role in this. Um, so Jorg, I know that you presented this to some of the CPOs in one of your conference board presentations. Um, and this was uh, not, this was well after the initial hit on the pandemic. Uh, and it's still going on. I assume there's at some level that the, this isn't the new normal yet. There isn't the normal, there's still a lot of uncertainty. What was the feedback that you received from your presentation as a follow-up? And um, do you think that things are shifting based on these, this continuing um, and instead of just the initial, but the continuing pandemic situation, would you adjust any of your perspectives based on any of the feedback or this continuing situation that we're facing? Overall, it seems to me like pretty stable results. So there was no one who, uh, who disagreed with the findings. 
Of course, we see heterogeneity, uh, in particular from sector to sector. It was also interesting again, how quickly some sectors um, who came almost to a halt are back to almost normal production. The issues they are facing now are, despite COVID is one of the reasons for it, but it is still attributed to other elements. One of the key issues is um, the closure of some key ports in China because of the uh, no case policy, um, which caused much more disruptions than the actual pandemic. So um, there are more elements to that now that uh, companies are considering. I think one of the, the conversations that we're having, not much in public, but more behind the scene is, how is our future relationship to China? And there were very different views on that, very heterogeneous. Of course, um, there is a high appreciation for the many people that they got to know over the time. So on a personal relationship, um, I feel that a lot of people are quite close to China. And then there's this other part that is, what is, how is China behaving towards us more as a, a government um, doctrine? What does that mean? So how is the government of China wanting to us uh, to, to operate with them? What's coming out? So this is something where people have a lot of question marks. Will other disruptions suddenly occur like these closures of ports or any uh, regulatory changes? And of course, like in every, every conversation, there's people with very different standpoints and these standpoints are discussed. And I think that is probably one of the hottest topics con talked about about how that highly important partner in our global value chains is behaving in the future and how to organize yourself into the new behavior that nobody can really anticipate. Okay. Okay. I'm going to have to stop it there. There's a lot more discussion, like the localization idea with this result in greater localization, more emphasis and so on. There's a digitalization argument. There's the agility argument that I've seen presented as well. Also, the sustainability that was well touched upon. Um, we have not really touched upon sustainability in the courses for this semester, Patrick, but next semester, I'm offering a course where we talk a lot more and central to the course is a circular economy. And definitely I will have some of the implications between the circular economy, sustainability and supply chain. So let me thank you and thank our uh, students who participated today as well. Um, and uh, I think that will be it. And we'll post this available to our classes. Um, and also we'll share it with our speakers as well, the video. So thank you, Patrick and York, for talking to us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank you all. Okay, now I need to stop this uh, recording.